Have you noticed? Whenever you see a commercial for ham on TV, it's often set in the countryside, with a nice family and a rustic backdrop. And the ham is always pink. Very pink. And 100% natural, of course. Ne passons pas à côté des choses simples. It looks so tasty, it has your mouth watering on the couch. Well, that's the point. But what if, behind this pretty pink, hid one of the biggest health scandals of our era? In 2015, the World Health Organization listed processed meats as carcinogenic for man. We decided to investigate the ingredients used by the giants of the food industry. It can induce DNA breaks, uh, mutate cells into sort of pre-cancer cells. We discovered that to impede or halt regulations on certain additives, food industry lobbies have been working in the shadows for decades. You have to understand that the industry is a money-making business, so they're very risk-averse. They're not going to fund a study that is bad for their business. It resembles pas mal à ce que faisaient les industriels du tabac, c'est-à-dire qu'ils payent des scientifiques pour dire le contraire de ce qui est vrai. At the heart of this strategy of influence are the scientists who collaborate. Did the meat industry pay you for this? I received some compensation for my time as well as the others. How much? I am not going to say. And the scientists who are targeted. Basically, we're trying to shoot me down or discredit me. I mean, that's what shoot down means scientifically. These efforts to go after the scientists and to discredit the scientists is a key element of a much larger strategy to just gum up the entire policy making process. Between intimidation, lies, and manipulation, we will uncover proof of a worldwide strategy where hitting below the belt is allowed. Leave now! Get the fuck out of here! Feeling hungry now? Then it's time to eat. Tonight, you are our guests. To find out how ham is made, we visited a factory. Welcome to Fleury Michon, one of the market leaders in France, and one of the few to play the card of transparency. The ham on your supermarket shelves starts out like this. Big lumps of pork meat. To add taste, a little vegetable stock. It all goes into a ham-shaped mold, and it's cooked. And the result? Perfectly pink, rounded slices. Have you grasped the basics? Well, let's rewind a little to see the detail that changes everything. To obtain this fine ham, there's another very important step. You have to inject the meat. A machine with a dozen syringes injects a liquid into the lumps of pork meat. The liquid contains an essential additive. Factory manager Laurent Rouleau shows us. These yellow sacs contain a mixture of salt and sodium nitrite, the additive E250. Le sel nitrité sert à assurer la conservation euh, du jambon, à lutter euh, contre des germes pathogènes et aussi de donner la couleur et le goût caractéristique de la charcuterie. Il va agir en donnant une coloration rosée en fait euh, à la charcuterie. In fact, he's telling us that the pretty pink of our ham isn't natural at all. It's thanks to sodium nitrite. This additive fixes the pink of the meat during cooking. Otherwise, ham would be the color of roast pork. That's why food industrialists can't do without it, as a processed meats producer would confirm. 
Le nitrite, c'est vraiment ça. C'est vraiment pour, pour la, la couleur, parce que ben, je vous dis, le jambon doit être rose, la crème doit être rose, elle doit pas être brune, euh, parce que sinon on va me dire qu'elle n'est pas fraîche, ou est, etc. Donc euh, en clair, je cuis une viande, ça donne un jambon gris. Mm -hmm. euh, c'est ce qu'il faudrait faire. Mm. C'est ce qu'il faudrait faire. Euh, Pourquoi quelque vous ne faites pas que... du jambon gris Mais Parce que personne ne va l'acheter. Tout simplement, personne ne va l'acheter. Et le marché ou, ou, ou le consommateur n'est pas prêt à ça. Donc pour vous, aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment un problème de couleur, en fait Ah ben clairement, oui. Clairement, parce que sinon, on peut saler la viande avec du sel de viande sans problème. Mm. Let's sum up. The ham's pink is unnatural, but without the pink, it would be impossible to sell. The big problem is that sodium nitrite is believed to be a danger to public health. The additive is suspected of playing a role in the development of colorectal cancer, one of the deadliest cancers in Europe. The cause? A phenomenon that takes place during digestion. It's chemistry, but we'll make it simple. You swallow a piece of cured meat. You think you're peacefully digesting it, But what you don't know is, the nitrite molecules are reacting with the meat proteins, transforming them into very dangerous substances. Nitrosamines. We went to the Netherlands to learn more about the effects of this chemical reaction on our health. To the Faculty of Medicine of Maastricht University. This is where the toxicologist Professor Theo de Koch works. He's been interested in nitrites for years, and by extension, nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are known to induce damage in the large intestine, so it can induce DNA breaks, uh, mutate cells into sort of pre-cancer cells, and that's of course something that you want to, uh, want to prevent. Professor de Cook notably wanted to find out what happens inside the body when we don't eat processed meat and when we eat a lot of it. To do so, he conducted an experiment with human guinea pigs, like I'll know. For two weeks, this student ate 300 grams of processed meat a day, the equivalent of eight and a half sausages or seven slices of ham. After 15 days, we saw that uh, the exposure to nitrosamines was considerably increased. So it was up to uh, between two and three fold increase as compared to the levels that we measured at the start. The researcher measured the impact on the organism of this chemical mutation of nitrites into nitrosamines. In his lab, he tested the fecal water of big processed meat eaters like Arnaud. So what you see here is uh, fecal water from four different individuals. To see what happens inside the body, the researchers mixed this fecal water with human cells, the white deposit in the test tube. Then they observed what happened to the cells. You see that if you have no exposure, you see that everything is intact, so the material stays together, but if you are exposed to nitrosamines that induce breakages of uh, the DNA, you see this comet tail appearing. So you see that here the damage is quite extensive. So the more damage you have, the more likely it is that a cell like this will eventually mutate into a pre-cancer type of cell. How long does it take for such a damage? Well, this damage can be induced relatively quickly. So in this assay, when we isolate the cells and we only expose them for half an hour, and then you already see the breakage of these DNA strands. So that's how fast it can happen. And that can also happen not just in the lab here, but also in an intact human body. And if we stopped using nitrites, then what? That would make a difference of potentially several thousands of colorectal cancer deaths in Europe every year. That's huge? That's huge because uh, colorectal cancer is a very frequent disease, uh, already small changes in uh, a cancer risk can have a big impact uh, 
in, in a large population. Thousands fewer cancers, and therefore potentially fewer deaths, just by suppressing nitrites. But the food industry has a sledgehammer argument for justifying the use of nitrites. It protects us from botulism. Botulism is a form of food poisoning caused by bacteria that affect our central nervous system and can be deadly. Scary, right? But there's a glitch in their argument. There are already companies which do produce processed meats without nitrites, and their customers are in fine form. If you happen to be in Copenhagen in Denmark, just after the Little Mermaid and the Quayside Promenade, pop into a supermarket, like we did. There you'll find cured meats without nitrites. And for those whose Danish has gone a bit rusty, it's uden nitrit. It's everywhere. You can easily recognize it by its color, more brownish than pretty pink. And the best known brand is produced 150 kilometers south of the capital in Denmark's biggest organic processed meat plant, Hanegal. The boss, a biochemist, started in nitrite-free cured meats 25 years ago. Since then, the Danish health authorities haven't registered a single case of botulism caused by processed meat. We do not have problems with this bacteria. I would say for the last 50 years, this has not been a reasonable uh, uh, topic in Western Europe. That was a problem in meat industry 100 years ago, where things were not as clean as they are, slaughterhouses were not as clean as they are today. So no worry about bacteria. Now we have to worry about additives that might be cancer producing. And if they are not necessary for some very good reasons, we should not use them. For you, the cancer risk today is the main risk? That's that the main risk today, definitely. And, and actually, it has been so for uh, 30, 40 years. Why do producers still put nitrates in meat? The main reason is that they are afraid that customers will not accept products which do not have the red color that they have been used to for many, many years. Hanegal is one of the few food industry companies to do without nitrites. And yet, experts have been ringing alarm bells for years. 25 years ago, a European Union health report already recommended reducing the amounts of nitrite used in processed meats. In 1999, this report even put forward banning its use altogether. Despite the increasing number of studies, the European Commission still allows industrial food companies to add lots of nitrites to the products. So we went to ask the Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, a former health minister in Lithuania, a few questions. Why don't get the levels lower? I would like to, 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 to guarantee you that it is, it is, of course, in the hands of, of, uh, of, of uh, institutions which are responsible to follow, to say, and to present to us final results. You know, it's, it always takes, takes, takes um, uh, time and, 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 uh, and the responsibility. For over an hour, the commissioner attempted to pull the wool over our eyes in spite of all the reports by experts, which, for 25 years, have warned the authorities about the dangers of nitrites. All these studies, you don't think they're enough? You know, all those studies are open. It's, 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 well, thanks to, to, to transparency, thanks to possibility to have them, to show to people, 
that we are ready to, to follow and to see and to do how to move for in, in, in as, as, as soon as possible. Transparency is good, but decisions are better. But sort of, all decisions are, are in, in, in lines of procedures. Can you imagine like, like that decision to make? If I will be king of the European Union, oh, <laughs> but I am not king of European Union. I mean, this story has been so going on for so long. No, 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 sorry to say. It's very sorry, sorry to say. This story shows that all standards are in safety line. In this case, why Europe lost against Denmark in the European Court of Justice in this night right story? I, I don't know. I, I can't answer this. I, I, I would like to, 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 to need more information because I am not one who knows uh, everything. So let's look at the facts, Mr. Commissioner. Denmark wanted to limit the use of nitrites. The European Commission was against it. And in 2003, in court, the Danes won in the name of the protection of public health. I am very happy about European court decisions. When European court decisions always show that public health is priority, it means that DG Sante and Commissioner responsible for public health is in better conditions. And yet, since this court ruling, EU regulations are just as lax as ever. From my point of view, we must be more energetic asking industry to change the technology, reformulate food, to follow uh, figures, to keep uh, uh, on board public health priorities, not profit, absolutely. But it's, uh, but it, of course, uh, it it's, uh, takes time. Time, perfect. That's just what the food industry wants and what it has built its strategy on for years. Because when it comes to nitrites, industrialists have been waiting out the clock for 40 years. 40 years of scientific manipulation, blackmail, and intense lobbying, so the meat business can carry on bringing home the bacon. And it all began on the other side of the Atlantic. If you think we're exaggerating, listen to this. In the late 1970s, nitrite was almost banned in the United States, just after the publication of a large-scale study requested by the government. A relationship between cancer and nitrite was proved, suggested? No, well, proved, and a fairly strong one. There were 2,000 rats involved in the study. It's a very extensive study done by a well-respected scientist. The banning of nitrites was announced in the press, but the American Meat Institute would bring out its big guns. In his office overlooking the Capitol, its president, Richard Ling, spoke out. Processed uh, meats that contain nitrites are a big, a big thing. The retail value of them, about uh, $12.5 billion. About uh, two-thirds of, of the hog production in the United States goes into cured meats, and uh, it presents a problem for uh, our industry and, and for the government. Uh, we're hope, hopeful that a solution can be found. Armed with financial analysis, the American meat lobby forced the government to back down. The banning of nitrites would send pork prices plummeting and cause an apocalypse. But it was a political event that would close the debate. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States. And guess who entered into government? Richard Ling, the president of the American Meat Institute himself. The idea of banning nitrite was forever buried. The experiment-based study on 2,000 rats ended up in the trash can. And after that, the same fate would await every scientific publication calling nitrites into question. In 
If you're wondering how the interests of industry can systematically win against what's at stake in public health, the following will enlighten you. Fifteen years after the victory of Reagan and the meat industrialists, a new study shook America to the core. If it's not one thing, it's another. A study finds a link between hot dogs now and cancer. Put yourself in the shoes of the average American Joe at the time. You and your family are eating hot dogs at the shopping mall or in the street, just as usual. The effect was immediate. In a matter of days, hot dog sales fell by 8%. And given the size of the American market, that represented millions of dollars less for the food industry. The author of the hot dog study that caused sales to plummet was Susan Preston Martin. She's now a retired scientist living near Los Angeles in a residential suburban setting straight out of an American soap. After several tense months of talks, she agreed to see us. But we had to insist right up until the last minute. The lady is very discreet. It's uh, Sandrine Rigaud what? from French TV. I don't know what you said. Mrs. Preston Martin? Yes. Yes, I'm Sandrine Rigaud from French TV. Hello. <laughs> no, I, I... With her discoveries on processed meats, the researcher was the victim of a number of attacks. But she agreed to look back at her work, which showed a link between the excessive eating of hot dogs and certain rare cancers in children. How did you find the relationship? Well, just the way we always did when we did case control studies, we started out with a group of children who had leukemia and compared them to a group of children who didn't have leukemia. And we asked the mothers about what they fed the children. And sure enough, the kids with leukemia ate more hot dogs. What did you think when you saw this strong relationship? Because it was quite a strong relationship. It was with hot dogs. I was a little bit surprised and just, um, reserved judgment, which is what epidemiologists do when they find something they don't expect. From that moment on, for the food industrialists, Susan Preston Martin became public enemy number one. In the meat lobby, they definitely didn't like what we were doing. They were terribly upset, and I could understand that, you know, their livelihood was making uh, processed meats, and they didn't want any um, anything coming out saying that those were not good for you. Basically, we're trying to shoot me down or discredit me. I mean, that's what shoot down means scientifically. What we discovered went much farther. The scientist had never realized just whom she was dealing with. America made the hot dog famous. Oscar Mayer gave it diggity. In the U.S., the undisputed champion of supermarket sold hot dogs has always been Oscar Mayer. America's number one. A brand of the Kraft Foods Group, a giant of the food industry. So far, no surprises. But what's less known is that at the time, and until 2007, Kraft was owned by Philip Morris, the world's second largest tobacco company a lobby which went as far as lies and manipulation to defend its own interests, notably in the big tobacco lawsuits of the 1990s. You believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. I believe nicotine is not addictive. Questioning proven scientific facts, the strategy worked perfectly for years with tobacco. So, Philip Morris used it again to save Oscar Mayer's hot dogs. To understand how the multinational manipulated science to defend its investments in cured meats, we headed to Northern California, to San Francisco. This university library holds what are commonly known as 
the tobacco documents, millions of internal tobacco industry documents. Our guide, Stanton Glantz, has spent his life unraveling the cigarette maker's strategies. Carton form. He particularly remembers one phrase used by a lobbyist in 1969. Doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. It is also the means of establishing a controversy. For him, everything is summed up in one word, doubt. And it was exactly like that, by creating doubt, that Philip Morris set out to discredit Dr. Preston Martin's study on processed meat and cancer in children. The proof is there, in the vast database of the tobacco documents. By typing Susan Preston Martin, you get hundreds of hits. And all in the Philip Morris file. The researcher's name crops up regularly in the titles of memos, letters, and internal reports. The multinational believed her study on hot dogs would reopen the debate surrounding nitrites from the 1970s. So it paid scientists to go through her work with a fine-tooth comb in order to find any weak points. Even her contracts and grant papers passed under the microscope. Basically, anything that could be used against her and weaken her in the eyes of the government and the press. Stanton Glantz only learned of this case through the documents we showed him. The approaches that they used to attack the person doing the research on linking cured meats with cancer were the standard things they do. One is to go through her work with a fine tooth comb and find every little thing they could possibly complain about. And because the issues tend to be fairly technical, you know, if you're a politician, if you're a reporter, unless you're a highly specialized reporter, all you hear is, well, this person said there was something bad and this other person said that they didn't know what they were talking about. And so these efforts to go after the scientists and to discredit the scientists is a key element of a much larger strategy to just gum up the entire policy-making process to the point where nothing happens. That translates into hundreds of billions of dollars of, of sales and profits for them. So the whole game is just to slow down. In the documents on Dr. Preston Martin, other, even more Machiavellian scenarios were studied. Here, it was suggested that talks be held with the scientist. And here, a proposed seminar in order to lure her. The aim? To influence her and even shape the conclusions of her future studies. The common point of these documents? They all come from the same lobbying firm, Multinational Business Services, Inc already hired by Philip Morris to contest the effects of passive smoking on health and headed by a certain Jim Totsi, a master of influence. Amazingly, in Washington, the heart of American power, this lobbyist is still well established. As he never answered our requests for an interview, we went to see him without an appointment, with our documents in hand and a hidden camera. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'm looking for uh, Mr. Jim Tazi. Uh, yes, he works here. Uh, who are you with? I'm a French uh, journalist. I'm working for France 2, and I'm working on the lobbying. Uh, do, you, do you have uh, an appointment? No, no, I was just looking for him because I called from France. But do you uh, just step inside, please. Yes, um, and he's not here now. Um, the good news, American lobbyists can be welcoming. We even managed to have Jim Totsi on his cell phone 
Here, uh, please. Uh, here, come on. Right, right in here, please. Um, here, uh, Jim, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I wanted to ask you some questions about uh, Susan Preston Martin. No, I don't, I don't even know the lady. How would you get my name? I, I haven't read her works or anything. Because you have uh, set up a strategy to discredit her work for uh, Oscar Mayer. So I wanted to know more about this. Well, well Bruce, can you do <laughs> What? Excuse me? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I have no idea what she's talking about. Hey, but uh, who is this? Uh, I mean, is this the press lady? Who, which newspaper? Should I, I, I have no idea who you're working for, so I'm going to have email. to leave. No, no, I can send no, you No, I'm email. going to have I, to I, ask you, you to leave. My I, 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 no, I'm just asking for a look, interview. Look, I understand you have a lot of If you like the you 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 like the welcoming lobbyist, you'll love the angry one. I'm asking you to... So we have no appointment. Now, please leave. Now, do I need to... Many leave. You can leave if you want. Yes, please, leave. Okay. I am ordering you out. Okay, just leave. Leave now. Out. Get the okay. fuck out of here. Okay, okay. No Do you understand? Get the fuck out. Now get the flying fuck out of here and do not come back. Thank you. Pity it had to end like that. In the end, Mr. Totsi did a great job. Well, at least for the industrialists. Back then, his anti-Preston Martin arguments were brought into the media spotlight by this health journalist on a major national TV channel a few days after the publication of the famous study. Let's get back to our hot dog study. Remember, they asked the people, did you eat a hot dog? They didn't ask them, did you put it in a bun? Did you put ketchup on it? Ugh. Did you put mustard on it? Now, you might be saying, who really cares one way or the other? But that's important because it may be that it's not the hot dog at all that's causing this increased risk of cancer. Maybe it's the bun. Maybe it's the ketchup. Maybe it's the mustard. So you have to be careful when you read these studies not to say, oh, this causes this. The powers that be didn't go any farther. The 1970s nitrites file, which could have resurfaced, remained locked away. You're probably wondering what Susan Preston Martin thinks, the woman targeted by the lobby. We showed her the documents, and what upset her the most was seeing that fellow scientists had played along with the industrialists. These professors will get paid a huge amount to do a re review by, um, in this case, probably the American Meat Institute. I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars. And they probably get more from doing this kind of thing than they do from their regular jobs. Seeing your name like this in all these documents. My goodness, I gave a lot of people a lot of work. <laughs> Were you aware of this? Well, I was aware that, that the processed meat community was concerned, but I'm not aware of all the extent of this. 20 years on, and she had turned the page. Not of interest anymore. That's how the public awareness of science goes. It's of interest, and then it's not of interest. So you mean you did all that work, but today? Oh, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's still in the literature, and um, it may influence people in future, and it has influenced people in the past, and that's fine. <laughs> But another scientist involved in the case has enjoyed a much more flourishing career. A scientist paid by the American Mead Institute to shoot down Susan Preston Martin's work. David Klerfeld. Today, David Klerfeld is head of the U.S. government's nutrition program, and he's invited all over the world for scientific conferences where he gives his expert's point of view, totally independently. I'd like to um, introduce the reasons why I think meat is an important component of a healthy diet. I'll spend just a very brief amount of time on that. On that day, he was in France, speaking to scientists from around the world about meat and the link between processed meat and cancer in order to denounce, backed up by PowerPoint, the climate of fear, panic, and even hysteria. And we know, because we were there. It was right at the start of our investigation, when we barely knew about nitrites, 
and had the need of enlightened specialists to help us. So there are new reviews published this year that say nitrite is not harmful and others that say it is harmful. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows definitively what, what the answer is. A few months after this handshake, when we had learned more about the industry of doubt, bells started ringing. So we took advantage of our trip to America to ask him for another interview. Only this time with a lot more cards up our sleeve. Do you remember being paid by the American Meat Institute? No. Never? No. I was interested in a scientist called Susan Preston Martin. Yes. Do you know her? Um, I, I know who she is. I do not know her personally. Uh, do you remember writing a paper on her? Yes. For the American Meat Institute? No. I found this, and it was prepared for the American Meat Institute. <sighs> OK. Um, there. Uh, th this is something different, yes. Uh, this was done 20 years ago, roughly. So um, I, I had forgotten about that. Do you remember how much you were paid for this uh, evaluation? No, I do not. As I said, it was 20 or 25 years ago. You didn't know when you were working for the American Media Institute that Philip Morris was owning Oscar Mayer? I'm, I'm not going to say yes or no at this point in time because it's more than 20 years ago. Did you know that the tobacco uh, strategy motto was doubt is our product? No, I never heard that. No? No. Doubt was your product too. Um, that, was not my in that was not my intent. My intent was to do an evaluation. Um, if I had read these papers and found that there were not shortcomings in the papers, that there were def not deficiencies in the papers, I don't think I would have criticized them. But don't you think that your point of view would be stronger and your argument stronger if I hadn't found that you had been once paid by the American Meat Institute? No, I don't, I don't think that um, would change. It, it wouldn't change my point of view. It might change your point of view um, that you tend to not believe what I'm saying because 25 years ago, I got some amount of money that I don't remember. Ah, we're making progress. He can't remember how much, but he does remember getting paid. But you have to understand that the industry is a money-making business, so they're very risk-averse. They would not fund a study that someone would propose to them that eating hot dogs increases the risk of childhood cancer. Why would they fund that? You know, they, they would only fund something that says, proposes that childhood cancer is prevented by eating more hot dogs or there's no relationship. You know, they're, they're not going to fund a study that is bad for their business. Well, at least he's honest. Much of the meat industry's lobbying depends on collaboration with paid scientists. And that's still how things work. During a conference on processed meats and cancer in Lyon, a French scientist confirmed it. Denis Corpé is a reference on the subject, an internationally renowned expert. He speaks and acts casually and doesn't balk at telling us how things work at scientific events. Il y a des gens, je me dis, c'est pas possible, quoi. Ils, ils veulent vendre leur soupe. C'est bon scientifique, mais ils disent, oh, bah, les nitrites, ça devrait être une vitamine. Le gars, il te prend un truc qui est un poison, en, th en théorie, et il te dit, oh, faudrait qu'on le classe comme vitamine. Dans les congrès sur le cancer, il y a systématiquement, à, au premier rang, deux, trois mecs en costard cravate qui posent des questions, qui disent, ah, mais en fait, est-ce que vous avez pris en, en considération tel truc Ah, mais en fait, euh, vous dites ça, mais un tel a dit le contraire. Donc, euh, bon, bah, nous, scientifiques, on n'a aucun doute. Mais tes journalistes, t'es là, tu dis, bon, bah, finalement, le gars, il montre un truc, mais il y a des gens qui disent le contraire, donc c'est 50-50. C'est pas 50-50, c'est 999 contre 1, et ce 1, il est payé par l'industrie. Voilà, il y a des gros enjeux. Hein. Ou je suis peut-être un peu parano, hein, mais je crois pas.
A few days later, Professor Corpe sent us some names and photos of scientists he suspects of being close to the food industry. Among them, two Americans he came across at a conference on meat and cancer. Andrew Milkowski and Nathan Bryan. As we checked out these scientists' profiles, we discovered a document which should certainly never have been on the web. An internal report issued by the American Meat Institute. It lays out the strategy for influencing the decisions of high-profile organizations. This organization is the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. This institution, based in Lyon, France, is the worldwide reference on cancer. In 2006, IARC scientists classified nitrites in the probably carcinogenic category of products, Group 2A. And that was bad for business. So, lobbyists are fighting to have this classification changed. Page 64 of the document. Change in the IARC nitrate nitrate classification from 2A to 2B, or possibly carcinogenic products. The strategy has a name IARC Challenge. It notably involves the two scientists we were interested in, Andrew Milkowski and Nathan Bryan. Armed with our brand new file, it was time to set off to meet the meat sector's heavyweights. Welcome to Nashville, Tennessee, the capital of country music, and notably the hometown of Johnny Cash. It's here that the American Meat Institute is holding its annual conference. In this huge building, to be precise, the meat industry in the U.S. is very, very big business. All of the world's biggest players are here. Smithfield, number one in pork, with a turnover of $14 billion a year. Cargill, the giant with $33 billion a year in food alone. And Tyson, the all-divisions record holder. This year we'll make, uh, with all of our divisions, between beef, pork, uh, poultry, and prepared, between $37 billion and $40 billion in revenue. So it's a small company. Very small company. <laughs> <laughs> we checked. It's over $41 billion. After half an hour, we spot a face in the crowd that rings a bell. That woman there tasting nibbles at every stand. That's right, page 92 of the IARC Challenge document. Here, with the short hair, the American Meat Institute's Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Janet Riley. Excuse me, please. Sorry. Hello. Yes. Are you Janet Riley? I oh, am. Yeah. Yes, hello. I'm Sandrine Rigaud. I'm working for France 2 on processed meat and cancer, and I have a question about the document I found. Uh, it is this document. Do, do you know it? I'm sorry. Who are you with? I'm working for France 2. OK, and I, I don't see you registered here. No, no, actually, I, I wasn't registered, but I have some important question. OK, could you give me your business card? Yes, of course. Okay. I have my journalist card. Just a question. I, I wanted to know, what do you know about the e -arc challenge? You know what? The e-arc challenge I'm here. Turn off the camera until I know what I'm doing. But uh, it's, it's about okay. nitrite and, okay, and can cancer. Thank you. No, no, this is mine. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and I wanted to know. OK, so much for our interview. Why is he with you? Why you Having been escorted outside... This is my press card. Okay. ...and been ordered to show ID, we try one last time. It's France 2. It looks like what tobacco industry did for decades. That's your opinion. That's your opinion. What we're doing is providing 
science-based, peer-reviewed evidence that our products are safe. And that's all I'm going to say right now. But are you paying those you scientists? Know I know you've got that camera rolling, don't you? Luckily, for such cases, we always have a plan B. On the list of IARC challenge scientists, there was one who agreed to see us. The first on the list, Andrew Milkowski. We head to Madison, Wisconsin. This city in the north of the United States is home to Andrew Milkowski and the company of hot dog king, Oscar Meyer, who we came across in the Preston Martin case. America's number one. The scientist worked for this company for 30 years. He now teaches at the university. But he doesn't hide his proximity to the American meat lobby. Presented with our IARC challenge documents, he acknowledges everything, or almost. So did the meat industry pay you for this? I received some compensation for my time as well as the others. How much? I am not going to say. I don't know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars? Small amounts. Small amounts? Can we have an idea? No. No? Defending nitrite seems to be a very big thing for industry. Looking for a substitutes has been attempted and was a, a total failure. Uh, something as chemically simple as nitrite uh, and as unique as nitrite, having a substitute uh, has not been possible to anyone's ability. But if there is a small risk of getting cancer, don't you think it's important to try to find a solution? That is where we disagree, because I do not believe that that risk is, is true. You think there is no risk at all? I think the risk is unquantifiable and unknown if it indeed exists. On hearing that, we pulled this expression. So for Andrew Milkowski, the colorectal cancer, the hundreds of studies on the dangers of nitrites, none of it exists. Off you go, nothing to do with it. In the United States, it's thanks to scientists like Milkowski that the meat industry has been able to cut another notch in its belt. Surprisingly, in the health conscious state of California, This imposing building is home to the state cabinet level California Environmental Protection Agency. We have an appointment with Sam Delson, Deputy Director for External and Legislative Affairs. He'll show us a document that doesn't exist in any other American state. Hello, Michelle. Long time no see. Hi, Sam. Hello. Somebody. So this is uh, the list? Yes, of all the agents. It's a list of substances judged dangerous to man by the state of California. To do business here, manufacturers are banned from using these substances or they are obliged to warn consumers. And it's very restrictive because there are over 800 products on the list. So a good example of that would be uh, tobacco smoke. We talk about lead. There's other things like uh, benzene. That would be something you know we have um, common in um, things like exhaust. Um, and then here we have aspirin. Um, and there's you have aspirin. Aspirin, yeah. It's a special note, especially for uh, pregnant women. Oh, here's kind of a an odd one, but you know things like breath and fern. You know, if you want to eat this, go for it. But be aware that you maybe don't want to eat it every single day. Um, so we don't find nitrite. Nitrite is not on the list. Mm -hmm. It's been years since nitrites have been targeted, but procedures have never been seen through. When we believe a chemical meets the criteria for listing, we post what's known as a notice of intent to list, uh, and that triggers a p period in which people can submit public comments uh, on whether it does or does not meet the criteria. We review the comments before making a final decision to complete the listing. 
Regarding nitrites, here are the comments that swung the scales. Of the seven contributions, six come from food industry lobbyists. And with 31 pages, the winner is Andrew Milkowski. Before the interview, we show Sam Delson all our documents on Milkowski, the IARC challenge, and the attempts at influence. Faced with an avalanche of proof gathered during months of investigation, he ends up taking out his cell phone to take photos. However, in answering our questions, he seems less inspired. Um, we, um... It's their business. If they think that they can uh, uh, influence a decision beyond the science, but we, we let the science do the talking. Do you think it might happen that sometimes you are manipulated by the industries? We um, do our best uh, to make decisions based solely on the science, uh, regardless of whatever uh, pressure or attempts at persuasion may be made by any outside group. Okay. California will re-examine the dangers of nitrites, but not before next year. For the lobby, it's a mini victory. Time gained and profits not lost. In Europe, a new study on nitrites was expected in December 2015. Almost a year later, it still has not been published. <laughs>